Hello and welcome to Legislative Report with your state representative, Warren Kampf. I'm Laurie Bull. Uh, the state budget has been passed and uh, can you give your, your summary, the, the highlights of that state budget? Sure, Lori. Um, we, uh, in, at the end of June, passed a uh, $27 billion budget. Um, it is slightly over the spend level for last year, um, but below the rate of inflation, the increase in inflation during the same period. Um, my own view is it really is truly a balanced budget. It's balanced in the sense that the revenues and the expenditures match up, but it's also balanced because I think it fairly treats our taxpayers. There's no tax increase in it, and we're in a very difficult time, so I think that's a very important thing that was a piece, a centerpiece of the budget. But I believe, based on our existing revenues, it, um, it funds priorities that people in my district um, care about and have. And certainly fiscal responsibility was a key driver in, in the priorities that were set forth in this budget. Can you talk about the importance of, of keeping that spending in check, uh, especially since we don't really know what's coming uh, here in the next year as far as revenues? Well, I think that's right. You're, you're right on the, the point. Um, you know, last year's budget, uh, the projections were really very close to what actually occurred and revenues towards the end of our fiscal year, April and May and June, um, were pretty good. But the news lately out of uh, Wall Street and you know, really in my district and across the world um, is uncertain, I think, when it comes to where our global economy and our state economy are headed. So we're gonna have to keep a, a very close eye on the uh, spending as the year unfolds. And certainly uh, there was a lot of, of prudent spending that had to go on, uh, but yet the core functions of government uh, certainly were funded. Can you talk about just that responsibility of balancing those two things? Well, right. Um, we funded, uh, for example, K through 12 education, which is you know, very important to many of my constituents. Um, at a higher level of state dollars than ever before. Um, people, I think, are aware by now, but uh, let me remind them uh, that prior to me coming to Harrisburg on behalf of the residents of the 157th, uh, the government here was using federal stimulus money to balance the budget, and they were putting a great deal of that money into the K through 12 um, line items. That money was all spent before I arrived in Harrisburg. Um, and because of that, there were some reductions around the state in funding for K through 12 education. But um, this legislature, uh, the House Republican Caucus and, and me too, um, have really made K through 12 education a priority in the budget. We did it last year. And again, this year, by increasing state dollars to K through 12 um, to a level that, that we haven't seen in the Commonwealth ever. There's a program called Accountability Block Grants, and $100 million was set aside for that. Can you describe what these do and, and why this type of a tool is attractive to school districts? Accountability Block Grants um, are used you know, all over the state as the school districts essentially want them to be used, but they've often been used for support of uh, kindergarten programs um, and other items. Um, February of this year, when the uh, governor came out with his budget proposal, he had eliminated the accountability block grants. Um, that was something that was unacceptable to me um, assuming we had sufficient revenues, and it turns out that, that we believe we will. So we restored in the legislature that $100 million uh, that the governor had removed from this year's proposal. So it is in the budget, um, and it is an important thing to really all the school districts in Pennsylvania. I guess one good thing about it is uh, oftentimes when government 
uh, dict dictates to school, uh, they send some funding down and they, they tell the school what it must be used for. This certainly gives them a little bit of flexibility to use that money where it fits best in their district. That's right, that's right. And, and there are a number of line items for all the schools that, you know, they have to spend the money. There was some concern among the school districts that a block grant proposal, um, which the governor had in his February address for other line items, uh, would have been the basis to reduce some of those line items like transportation. Uh, and that block grant proposal was eliminated in the final budget. But the accountability block grants, something that has been around for several years, um, were restored because they do give flexibility to the school districts. And also, um, distressed schools oftentimes are urban school districts that have a number of problems uh, from the get-go. They were uh, given some additional funds in this budget as well. Well, that's right. I mean, I think in, in my region, people would look to the Upper Darby or the uh, Chester Upland School Districts and the Philadelphia School District um, as school districts that really have serious, serious financial problems. And the distressed school district number, I believe, was about $50 million um, in additional dollars in the, um, in the state education budget for just those types of situations. Um, in addition, uh, aside from education, one of the concerns that was talked about, counties were very concerned about um, a 20% decrease in funding that was proposed by Gover Governor Corbett. Uh, what was done, and that was in regards to health and human services type funding and, and things like that, uh, what was done in regards to that? Um, you know, to explain to, to folks who are watching, um, many, through the Department of Public Welfare, uh, many uh, people, say, with intellectual disabilities uh, are given funding, waiver funding, Social Security funding, um, but some who do not qualify for those particular waivers or those programs receive their support and help through our county system. There are still state tax dollars, however, that are being used by the counties. Um, and there was a proposal in the governor's original budget in February to reduce that county funding by 20 percent, but also to give the dollars in a block grant uh, form, uh, again, to try to give flexibility to the counties. Mm -hmm. And in the past, counties have asked for that sort of flexibility. In the end, the final budget, which we adopted in, in June, uh, restores a substantial amount of those dollars that the governor had proposed um, eliminating. I believe we put $84 million back into that county human services line item. Um, so the reductions are less than 10%. And we also added for the first time additional dollars for emergency waiting list issues. This is somebody who is being cared for by their elderly parents, cannot care for themselves. Um, and in the past, those dollars were not available. Also, children coming out of high school who have very significant special needs, I think about $17 million was put in, new money was put into the budget for those sorts of uh, cases. So I think in the end, the balance that we crafted for human services, for our counties, for people like this in need was a good one given available resources. Um, switching to you know, our tax structure and things like this. What in the budget is good for job creators? Is there good news, you know, in the state budget for them? Yeah, and I, I would say to most people in my community, kind of the two most significant issues are, you know, fiscal responsibility at all levels of government um, and the, the question of the economy, you know, of the job sector. And I think in the last year with this budget as well as a piece of it, we have crafted a situation which is fiscally responsible, so it's not increasing the burden on our job creators. There are no tax increases at all in the last year and a half on our job sector in Pennsylvania, and that's important to them. That's what they tell me is important to them. On top of that, 
we've done some tax reduction where it made sense. In Pennsylvania, there is a double tax called the stock and franchise tax on many of our small businesses. And we phased that down last year. We're continuing to phase it down this year. And it's going to be eliminated, I believe, by 2013. So that's important to job creators. On top of that, I think we have to recognize we have a lot of people still who are unemployed. Um, and what can we do to try to move them into the workforce? We just adopted with this budget Keystone Works. This is a program that will allow um, people who are on unemployment compensation to go through an eight-week training program at a participating employer. So the employer is not going to have to pay wages to train this person. And we often hear in today's world how uh, people looking for work, their skill set doesn't match up with the available positions. And we hear on the other side. And, and so, so this program, Keystone Works, is going to allow employers to train someone while they are on unemployment compensation for eight weeks. And at the end, hopefully, there will be a, a match, um, an existing position for that person on unemployment compensation in that participating employer. And if not, they've still gotten valuable training that they can then market to, say, the next available position. Um, on, on top of that, I think you are seeing um, from Harrisburg reductions in regulatory um, burden on our job sector. We did some tort reform last year, some lawsuit abuse reform and some other things. We just passed into law a requirement that our state agencies actually look at regulations before they're adopted to see if they're going to have an impact on the small businesses in particular. Sure. Um, so I think that's helpful to the job sector. And ultimately, I think we also have to take a serious look at um, you know, I represent a, a community where there is a lot of uh, technology, a lot of life sciences employment, um, and there are a lot of startups in, in those sectors. We just had a hearing down at the Tredyffrin Township building where, where I live on a proposal that we have to maybe try to convert some tax credit dollars into uh, money that can be invested through the Ben Franklin partnerships, the greenhouses. Um, and, uh, and the Tobacco Settlement Fund venture capital system that's long been in place in Pennsylvania. It goes back to the Thornburg administration to try to help some of these startups uh, create new jobs. Um, they're having a hard time getting access to capital. You know, banks are, are not as likely to lend as they were in the past. And this is something that may also help job creators. So I think we've got a lot of tools available to us and that we're working on uh, in this difficult economy. And, and certainly anywhere that we can partner and bring sectors together is a good thing. And, and speaking to that, the Educational Improvement Tax Credit is a way to bring, bring businesses uh, together with education. Can you talk about what that is and how that was enhanced in this budget? So the Education Improvement Tax Credit is something that has been around for a while mm -hmm. And essentially, it allows um, dollars contributed by corporations of all sizes um, to be used by educational improvement foundations. In my area, we have, for example, um, the Phoenixville Education Foundation. In Tredyffrin East Town, we have um, uh, Flight. Uh, and these organizations benefit from those EITC tax credit dollars that corporate money is going to support. Um, on top of that, they also provide for um, scholarship funds for children in need uh, to go to uh, private schools. Let's say they have special needs, um, dyslexia, potentially learning disabilities, and these dollars are available for them. So it is a partnership between uh, the business sector or the job sector and the education sector. Um, and it doesn't take away money, in my opinion, from the public education system, which is also quite good and, and in need of support um, in, in my region. Um, and I would just lastly say, we hear a lot from employers 
uh, today, we have for a long time, about how important education is to them, having an educated and a skilled workforce. So I view this tax credit and the increase that we gave in this budget, we, I, maybe that was what you were driving at, we increased the level of the tax credit, I think up to $100 million. Um, and then we added an additional tax credit, similar type of program in those areas in Pennsylvania where the schools are really not perform performing very well. Um, uh, so that, that those students can have access to a, a quality education. So I think we, we have done uh, something very positive with the EITC in this year's budget. And just to clarify, the, this program works with public and private schools, um, am I correct on that? It does, yes it does. Um, and uh, you know, but again, the main point is to try to provide dollars to programs and scholarship programs that help children who may not on their own be able to access a quality education. Sounds like a great program and it's good to see that it got some attention this year. Uh, this is a good point to, to stop a moment and, and take a break. Let's take a quick break and when we return we'll talk more about the state budget and some other hot issues that are going on right now in Harrisburg. Legislative Report will return in just a moment. Did you know that the chamber of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives contains a painting depicting the 24 hours of the day? Located in the center of the ceiling, the mural titled The Hours was created by artist Edwin Austin Abbey. This wonderful masterpiece charts the setting of the sun, moon, and the many stars that grace the heavens. 24 maidens, who each represent an hour of the day, begin each day in light and gladness and ends in solemn drapery carried on still shoulders. Now you know. Did you know the Avenue of Flags presentation at Indian Town Gap National Cemetery has over 500 casket flags? Among the flags displayed are Commonwealth, Territorial, and Military flags. The flags are tied to 20-foot poles spaced 40 feet apart on both sides of the main drive of the cemetery. It takes about two hours to set up and take down all of the flags. Volunteers are encouraged to help with this task and must be at least 13 years of age. All of the flags are donated to the Avenue of Flags by families of the deceased. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. We've been discussing the state budget with your state representative, Warren Kampf. Uh, one of the things going forward, I guess, that could threaten the stability of future budgets really is the, is the pension problem that we have both with the state employees and uh, school employees' pension systems. And it's an issue that you've been really concerned about and active on. Can you talk about uh, the bill that you have that would make a change to these systems and how they operate? Yeah, my bill, it's actually two bills, would uh, for future hires require essentially a defined contribution or a 401k plan at both the state level and at the school district level. And my own view is the history of the pension system, which we're now you know, having to live with, is one of the best arguments for going to the, what these bills do. Um, we are significantly underfunded, Lori. Uh, I think we're about $40 billion if you total up the, um, the shortfall in both the state and then the school district pensions. And at the state level in the budget this year and, and also at the school districts, um, a great deal of money is having to be put into those pension systems in order to keep them going and keep them right. solvent. Um, and I really think that our taxpayers have been over the years disserved by the granting of very, very good benefits uh, and then the failure at the state level to fund them appropriately. Um, we do have court cases that, that uh, seem to say we can't change benefits for um, people once they have been granted, um, and there's a, certainly a level of unfairness in doing that. Uh, but I think going forward, we've got uh, to make sure that our taxpayers are treated fairly 
And I think a defined contribution plan or a 401k plan would do that. Um, if, if they're not addressed or reformed in some way, what's your thought on, on what could happen down the line? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't even want to think about that, Lori. I think we just have to reform them. Uh, we have to properly fund what, we've, what promises we have already made unless there's some, some change out there. Um, and I, I just think that's the work that we have to set to do. And I, I hope we, we're able to do it this fall or, or next year because um, I know my school districts and, and my taxpayers are, are really focused on this issue. And that's one of the reasons why um, I worked so hard on that legislation and introduced it uh, about two months ago. Uh, moving on to, a, to another completely different issue uh, that really has generated a lot of press. Um, the, the privatizing of the state stores, um, where is that right now in the pipeline as far as legislation goes? Um, you know, this is an issue privatizing the liquor stores that's been around for a long time. A few weeks ago in June, uh, debate began on the House floor on a bill that would have privatized the licensing of, of liquor and wine. Um, the debate uh, stopped and uh, Representative Terzai and, and the governor indicated that uh, this fall uh, they would return to that subject. So we may see this fall uh, 2012 uh, a debate on the subject again and potentially a vote. I mean, my, my own view, and I think it reflects the views of my uh, constituents, is that it doesn't make any sense for the state to be in the business of selling liquor and wine. Um, I do think we have to recognize we're in a difficult time. There are people in that system uh, working there, 4,000 across the state, um, and we have to be mindful that um, you know they they certainly have a stake in this, and they've they've worked for a long time in some cases. Uh, but I also think that we have to care about our consumers as well and recognize that this system does need to go through some very significant changes. In your opinion, how would, would going to a private system affect things like price and selection and, and uh, maybe even convenience? Yeah, I, I believe that the consumer would benefit from a change. Uh, I think um, you have a lot of people who are going across our borders into other states. They're Pennsylvanians, but they're purchasing because the selection is better there. In some cases, the prices are better there. So I think if we did that here at home, uh, we would have uh, at least the same and hopefully lower prices, probably over time with the private sector, better revenue and additional taxes collected on private businesses that aren't collected today uh, on our public state store system. So I think in the, in the long run, um, changing that system is going to be a benefit to the consumer and, and, and probably to the state budget. Another thing that you uh, wanted to talk about today is funding for Penn State University and, and with the things that are going on there. Um, what are your thoughts about that and what, what do you want to share with your constituents regarding Penn State? Well, it brings up the subject of higher education funding, um, which is very important to everybody in Pennsylvania, but um, certainly my constituents are no different. Um, and I've heard uh, out there talking to people in the last um, year and a half that higher education funding for our state system and our state relateds like Penn State and Temple is important. Uh, last year, uh, again, partly because of this stimulus dollar problem that those dollars went away, there was a reduction in funding to higher education. Uh, this year, the governor in February proposed reducing it even further. However, through the budget process and at my urging as well, um, we have uh, level state funding. So from last year to this year, our state universities, um, our state related universities like Penn State are going to be receiving the same amount that they received last year. And also I think good news to uh, parents of children uh, in my district, the uh, tuition increases either with Temple, it's actually zero this year, or with the state system, it's I think below the rate of inflation or maybe a slightly above, but just at 3%, which is a lot less than they have done in the past. And that was part of the budget discussion. Um, uh, people in the legislature went to our state system and to our state relateds and, and asked them to go easy on the tu tuition payers this year, and, and they obliged. Um, 
Penn State specifically, obviously that's on a lot of people's minds. You know, my view is what happened up there um, and with this Jerry Sandusky scandal was absolutely awful. I mean, you can't say that enough. Um, but I do think that funding of Penn State is important. There are students there. There is a, a, a excellent history of educational success there. Um, and at the satellite campuses, including Great Valley, right near where I am. Um, and I don't think we want to jeopardize that. And I am honestly a little bit concerned about the announcement from the NCAA just a couple of days ago of the, of the sanctions, although you know, certainly that program put football above children, um, and that is a tragedy and, and, and is a crime um, that there are criminal investigations and Mr. Sandusky himself is behind bars and likely to never see the light of day. Um, but I do think that we have to worry about the impact of, for example, the NCAA sanctions on the university, on the core function of education that's so important to me and my constituents. Um, so that's what I, I would like to say about, mm -hmm. about what's going on at uh, Penn State. Uh, Recently, there was a rally here in Harrisburg uh, protesting a voter ID law that, that is uh, getting ready to be. Actually, it's in place right now, and there was a, a trial run for the, for the primary where you had to show photo ID to be able to vote. Uh, your thoughts on, on the purpose of that law and uh, you know, how it will play out in the fall? So the, the voter ID law really just requires a, um, a citizen who's going to vote in Pennsylvania to present a photo ID, mm -hmm. something that is common when you go to cash a check or um, you know, really conduct some of the more important things um, in your life as a citizen. And it never made any sense to me that you could walk into a polling place, say a name, mm -hmm. sign a signature which was right there in front of you, and then go and vote. That didn't seem to me to be terribly protective of the right of voting. So um, I think that the voter ID law made sense. It also allows for any individual who cannot afford an ID um, that one will be provided free of charge by the state to that individual. Um, I have been reaching out to people in my uh, community ever since we passed the law before April of this year. We've been cooperating with, for example, senior centers to try to get the word out. We've had very few people thus far come to the state office or contact us with a need to make a change, but we are out there and available and want to help if anybody does need um, uh, help getting an ID. Um, on top of that, I noticed that the administration said that they would provide a special kind of a, uh, a voting ID, photo ID, uh, probably at the end of August it will be available for people who can't produce, say, uh, a social security card or a birth certificate for reasons that are they're not of their own doing. Your office is, is ready and willing to help people get an ID if they do, do not have one currently. Absolutely, please anybody contact my office 610-251-2876 or through the website repcamp.com for any of your issues or needs but particularly if you need an ID before November um, we're there to help. Well, thank you so much. We certainly went through quite a number of issues today, and, and thank you for uh, uh, being here and also just updating your constituents on, on the top issues in Harrisburg. Thanks, Lori. It's my pleasure. Sure. And if you have comments or questions about these or any other legislative topics, Representative Camp's contact information will be shown in just a few moments. I'm Laurie Bull. Thanks for watching, and join us again for Legislative Report.